Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, our resurrected Christ. Welcome to worship. Thanks for being a part of Common Grace this morning. My name is Kyle Reynolds. I'm the pastor here, and I'm thrilled that you've taken a part of your weekend to, to worship with us. So a few announcements. Number one, um, we're pre-recording, so I can't tell you exactly how the event went yesterday, but I do think that, that I probably did really well in all of the competitions, and we had a great time. So um, I, I do just want to tell you to be on the lookout. We'll have more events as we look ahead, both uh, to the celebration of Common Grace uh, at Ball Conference Center on the 15th of August and then uh, later in September and maybe even some interim things. And so uh, just stay on the lookout for those and I would love to have you be a part of those things. Of course, all of that is in relation to what we announced last week that the Common Grace is moving from our, our two and a half year home at the Ball Conference Center to the Ridgeview campus of Grace United Methodist Church this fall, starting in September. And so as I said last week, uh, we're really excited about that. We think it creates all kinds of new opportunities um, and and so we're going to celebrate where we've been and we're going to celebrate and look ahead to what uh, what we're moving into uh, over the next few weeks. So um, anyway, if you want more information about that, you can reach out to me. You can find info online uh, on our Facebook page or, or on uh, Common Grace's website, commongrace.church. Um, and I would love for you just to stay uh, uh, stay up to date on those things and look forward to, to ways to celebrate with you and prepare for what's ahead. Hey, thanks for keeping our, our mission trippers uh, in prayer uh, this week as we had our high school students out. Uh, we have one last group going out in, in this upcoming week. Um, sorry, a week from now. So we'll keep them in prayers as well. But I got to spend some time this week with our, our high school students and God is doing good and wonderful things through their work uh, as they've served down in the Argentine district. Uh, last thing, uh, we've got a great worship service. Uh, and so I'm glad that you're here. We're going to have good music. Uh, we're going to hear from Stacy about the armor of God. We're continuing in this uh, Seasons of Summer series, looking at rest and talking about what summer invites us into as a as an in-between time, a time of transition. Uh, so thank you so much uh, for being with us in worship, and, and I hope that this will be a joy and a celebration for you. Let's uh, continue with singing.
thank God that yesterday's gone. Yes, all oh, my sins are forgiven. I have been washed by the blood. It's great to have you all with us this morning while we continue our conversation about confidence. And confidence is seeing yourself the way God sees you. And true confidence comes from knowing how much God loves you and God is with you no matter what. Oh, you're probably wondering why I have this on my head, right? Well, it's because I have a soccer game later today. Just kidding. We know that this protects my head when I'm riding a bike, right? If I'm going to a soccer game, I would want to wear something like these to protect myself from getting hit in the shins, correct? What other protective gear might we wear? Well, we might put something like this on our eyes if we're protecting our eyes. Or maybe if we're working with some tools, we might wear some thick gloves so that our hands don't get cut. How about if you're out on the water, especially like a lake or an ocean, you might wear a vest like this to protect you and keep you safe. Can you imagine going to a football game without wearing the protective gear to make sure you don't get hit? So it's one thing to protect ourselves when we're talking about sports and other activities, but what about our faith? Is there some protective gear we need to put on with our faith in our growing relationship with God to make sure that we succeed? Well, our Bible story today comes from Ephesians, and Paul is writing from prison to the church of Ephesus to encourage them to be practical. He's trying to tell them that following Jesus is as simple as, well, getting dressed. Let's look at what Paul says at the end of his letter to the Ephesians, and he says, Finally, let the Lord make you strong. Depend on God's mighty power. Put on all God's armor. Then you can remain strong. Now, as a prisoner, Paul would definitely have been familiar with a Roman soldier's armor. And he would have known that when a soldier had all their armor on, they would be able to protect themselves against anything. So Paul is trying to tell us to put on God's armor. Now, this isn't something that we can just buy off of Amazon. So what did Paul exactly mean? Well, let's take a look. First, Paul writes, put the belt of truth around your waist. Now, just as a Roman soldier would put on a belt to hold up their loose clothing and weapons, and we put on a belt every day, every day we can choose to put on or remember the truth that God loves us, and God is always with us, helping us make that wise choice. Next, Paul tells us to put the armor of godliness on your chest. Now, a soldier's breastplate would have protected their heart. And our protection for our heart is godliness. And that simply means following what God says to do and how to live. By loving God and loving others, that's the best protection we have against the unkindness that we sometimes encounter in the world. Next, Paul says, wear on your feet what will prepare you to tell the good news of peace. Now, you might not think of shoes as armor, but you've heard me talk about walking, walking, rocky, walking rocky trails before. And my trail shoes have a really thick sole to protect my feet against those rocks. Just like a Roman soldier's sandals would have had deep spikes on them to make sure they got a grip. Paul is just telling us that we can share God's message of peace and love everywhere we go. 
Next, Paul says, pick up the shield of faith. Now, a soldier would need a shield for a couple reasons. They'd need it to protect themselves against the attacks coming at them, like arrows and rocks, but they could also use it to push away an enemy. So shield of faith means for us trusting in what we can't see because of what we can see. It's trusting in knowing that God is there. Maybe you get a thought like, I'm not good enough, but you pick up that shield of faith and you push that thought away because you know that nothing can separate you from God's love. Now, Paul next writes about the helmet of salvation. We know a Roman soldier wouldn't use a helmet quite like this, but the helmet does protect the head and the mind. And so the helmet of salvation means living each day knowing that Jesus is God's son and that Jesus is life death and re resurrection proves to us that nothing can stop God's love to us. And lastly, Paul writes, and take the sword of the Holy Spirit. The sword is God's word. The Bible is sometimes called God's word and it was inspired by it was inspired by God's Holy Spirit through people who wrote these words. And when you remember it and read it, you can remember the truth about how God sees you. Now we're going to encounter troubles in this world. We may get some broken bones and splinters. We're probably going to argue with our family and friends and well, stuff is just going to happen to us. But Paul reminds us to put on God's armor. It's not the kind of armor that you can see, but it will prepare you for those troubles that you can't see. You can be protected from things like a bad attitude or negative thoughts. It can shield you from those times when you start to doubt what's true. So when voices inside you are trying to tell you that you're not good enough and that you don't matter, pick up your sword of God's word and fight back. Fight back with the truth because the truth is you do matter. God loves you so much that God sent Jesus to help us remember this forever. So that's the one thing to remember today. Use what God has given you to stand strong. So gear up and be sure to join us next week as we finish our conversation about confidence this summer. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Come to me, all you who are weary.
burden and I will give you rest come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give As we continue in worship, I would invite you to uh, turn your hearts to a time of prayer. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, by the power of your spirit, we ask that you would renew the spark within each one of us. We are all too often exhausted and we need to know your rest and recovery. We are all too often familiar with going through the motions. Would you uh, restore each one of us? Would you light the fire within us? Would you move within us that we may be moved to work for your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven? Lord God, remind us that there is no place that we can go from your presence. Invite us into the gracious burden that only you can offer, where we can find healing and wholeness that we never know apart from you. 
May we hear the invitation of Christ, inviting us to experience a full life right here and right now, inviting us to acknowledge your presence here by the power of your spirit, inviting us to rest in the way that only you can bring us rest. God, in the midst of all of this, help us to keep in mind those near and far who need healing and wholeness in the most acute of ways right now. We think of unrest in Afghanistan and South Africa, in Cuba and Haiti, and in places all around the world. We think of those at home and abroad who are facing brutally hot weather and weather events on a near daily basis. We remember those who continue to struggle against COVID, most especially in some of the most vulnerable places around the world. Lord God, we ask that you would help us. You would urge us, you would move us to be healers and peacemakers, to mourn with those who are weeping, to rejoice with those who dance, to grieve in seasons of loss and to persist in seasons of healing. Help us remember those in our own homes, in our own neighborhoods, in our own workplaces, in our own cities, who are in the process of healing and looking for hope, who are waiting for relief from all kinds of things. God, would you guide us to extend grace to those that we know need it in our lives. In all things, we ask for your presence to go uh, with and before us, to work in and through us, to restore and renew us. May we as a community continue to do that work and invite others to do that work as well. May we invite others to experience the power of your spirit and the overwhelming nature of your love. May we help others to experience your kingdom now, not in some distant time. Lord God, be with us in this time of worship. Guide us in, in these few moments that we have together and in the week ahead. Lead this community of your followers called Common Grace in this seasons of, season of transition. And lead each one of us to find your rest in these days. All this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Cause I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. So set a fire down in my soul that I can't contain, that I can't control. Cause I want more of you, God. I want more of you, God. This morning we continue our series, Seasons of Summer. It's week two of looking at rest. Uh, and we have one more week after this of looking at rest. Last week, we talked about rest as recovery, about how, how many of us, especially after this 16 month pandemic that we've been through, we need that recovery. And we looked at that, that odd story from 1 Kings of Elijah and said, perhaps we need to find good, healthy, uh, positive ways to withdraw and, and that we need to pray fervently and honestly and cry out to God. And, and that we need physical rest, like relaxation, like fall asleep, like actual rest. Uh, we believe that summer, I believe that summer invites us into seasons of rest. And sometimes that, that leads us uh, to recovery. Um, like we need to do that. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Like just do that right away. This week, we're going to talk about rest that leads us uh, to restoration. Uh, rest that recreates us. Rest that allows us to experience delight. And I think especially in summer, we're invited into this. As, as we talked about last week, summer has 
different sort of rhythms. It has more space, more margin. And, and maybe that's not the case for you. Maybe there's a different season of the year that does that. But for many of us, uh, uh, th th it's summer. So, so maybe if kids are at home and it's a more chaotic season, summer isn't the time. But I hope that there is some cycle of your year, of, of your life, where, where you sort of uh, have this invitation to, to move a little bit slower. You have a little more margin. You move at a different sort of, of rhythm. And, and what I think is after we get through this, this recovery stage, we, we do the triage, then we begin to put things back together. We get into that, that recovery and recreation or recreating sort of thing. It's like physical therapy that comes after surgery. We, we, we begin to work the muscles and, and reform and relearn and reshape them. Uh, and, and we spend time connecting with God and with ourselves and with others and creation. And so I wonder what is the sort of restful activities that do that for you in your life? Uh, maybe summer is a time where you jump into a hobby that you like to do. It could be reading, it could be gardening or, or running or playing an instrument, or, or maybe it's just napping. Uh, wh what's the time of year where you jump into that hobby? Or maybe the summer is the time of year where you uh, connect to neighbors, that you see old friends, that you make time for a family reunion or a week at grandma's, or, or you have a, a picnic for absolutely no reason at all. Uh, maybe there's uh, a time during the summer where you learn a new skill take on a new adventure, find a new challenge, uh, adopt a big project, something that's going to push you and challenge you. But you can do it because there's more space and margin. What are the things that, that bring you life and vitality and energy that, that engage you? They, they may challenge you or they may wrap you with, with confidence and assurance uh, that, that you can get lost in. What are those activities somewhere, uh, something uh, th th that sparks the holy spark in you um, th th that often uh, gets you to, to notice um, things that you can't notice when you run ragged and you're in need of recovery. Uh, what, what, what is that for you? I'm going to guess that for some of us, the first place that our mind goes is vacation. Uh, uh, what's a good vacation like for you? But, but I want to, I want to, go a little bit deeper because oftentimes vacation is really just about finding recovery. Uh, it's merely taking time off, uh, vacating responsibility, vacating one particular place and going to a, a different place. And friends, I'm not saying that's bad. We need those in life. But that's not moving into the, the restoration and the recreation. That's just recovery. It's great if it's unplug and unwind. That's wonderful. That's recovery. But what I'm asking today is what is it that builds back up? That doesn't just get us to, to like getting by, but, but relights the spark, energizes us, uh, reconnects us with the holy, reconnects us uh, with family and friends, something that, that, that builds us up and, and sort of sends us out. Uh, wh what makes you feel alive again? So what are those things for you? Maybe it's, maybe it's a history walk, walking the Freedom Trail in Boston. Uh, maybe it's a nature walk, perhaps immersed in something that reminds you uh, just how small you are. Maybe it's a walk with an old friend or a walk in an old familiar place. Uh, maybe it's a walk around a different culture. So maybe all of that happens in, in some sort of vacation setting, but maybe it's not that. Maybe it's right here at home, uh, getting your hands dirty uh, with a project in the garden. Maybe it's a walk through the neighborhood and doing it at a pace where you get to stop and talk to everybody as you go, to chat with people as you pass. That, that same author that I referred to earlier in the, the sermon uh, talks about going to a used bookstore one summer, what she calls her other church, and asking the owner if he had a section uh, of Western books. A and the owner said, uh, well, have you got all day? And she said, you know what? I really kind of do. Uh, when in life, and for many of us it, it's summer, but, but when in life do you get the moment to say, you know what? I actually kind of do have all day. And when life presents that opportunity to you, what, what do you do? After you recover, if you still have time, what do you feel led towards? Maybe it's something you only have time to do in the slower pace of summer. So let me give you some examples. Hope and I were talking about vacations this week as I was preparing for this sermon. Uh, uh, we, we got away for a few days right after Easter this year, and that was pure recovery for me. Like I spent the first half of it sleeping uh, more hours probably than I was awake. Uh, but then after Memorial Day, Hope and I got uh, a few days away with some friends at the lake, and that 
that was pure restoration. I, I didn't come back any, uh, any more caught up on sleep than I went into it. I, I definitely wouldn't have said I was rested, but I can tell you that I was filled to the brim with spirit, with energy, that I was alive, that the conversations and the connection and the reconnection with those people and the, the staying up and talking late into the night filled my soul in ways that, that, that I can't even explain. That for me was restoration. What are the things that do that for you? Uh, we also, um, we're talking about vacations we've taken in the past. Um, so I love to climb mountains. And so the last few years, uh, around August, I've headed to Colorado and, and, and I love to hit a 14 or two. Uh, um, or if you have a friend slash guide who is feeling particularly cruel, uh, maybe you climb four of them in one day wouldn't suggest it. Anyway, I think Hope thinks that I'm crazy for doing this at all, but it's restorative to me. Part of it is being in nature, uh, but, but part of it is the challenge and the, the, the two thirds of the way up the mountain when you want to throw your friend slash guide off the mountain, uh, uh, but you also wonder if you're going to finish making it up. It's, it's that challenge for me that, that is actually life-giving. It's the beauty. It's the realization of how small we are and how big creation is. I, I love it. But again, Hope thinks that I'm crazy. We were also talking about a vacation that we took uh, many years ago, back when we were engaged. I got invited to go with her family to New York City. It was the week before Christmas, which is a really cool time to, to be in New York. Um, and, and trust me, we saw basically all of New York. We, we walked more than 10 miles every single day. Um, and, and we saw museums and we went to the Statue of Liberty and we went to great restaurants and landmarks and just had an amazing time. And you would think that all of this would be really great for somebody who likes to climb mountains on vacations and someone who can basically recite every single line of Home Alone 2 Lost in New York. So, I mean, I was like getting to live my childhood uh, as we were walking around. All that's true, except it turns out that, that the week before Christmas is sort of a hard time for a pastor to take time off. Advent is sort of like a four week sprint for pastors. And, and I was gonna come back a little bit early to, to do the Christmas Eve services and, and all of that. And, and so here's, here's why I say all of this. To me, climbing mountains in August at the end of a season where I've had restoration, where, where I've had a summer to move at that slower pace, uh, taking on the challenge of climbing a mountain in that moment, that's awesome, that is restorative, that is wonderful, and that is great. Uh, walking 10 miles plus a day in New York City in the midst of the, the season that is a sprint for me, it was great, it just wasn't exactly uh, um, restorative. It didn't, didn't fill me up in maybe quite the same way. I wasn't able to enjoy it because I hadn't done that rest as recovery that prepared me for this piece the challenge. And so I'm asking you this morning, what is this piece after you've recovered, after you've caught up on sleep, after you've, you've sort of gotten your, yourself back to a homeostasis, a, a sustainable level, what are the things that you do then? What does that look like? Uh, that's what I want to ask this morning. When I think about summer as a season, that's what I think about. It's the invitation to recover from all of the busyness and to find uh, a recreation and, and restoration, not merely uh, from not being uh, tired, but, but to being filled up. That's what I think about. So I want to bring it a little bit closer to home because I want to be clear. It, this doesn't require driving for hours or, or hopping in a plane or going anywhere else. Uh, none of that is, is pivotal to what I'm talking about. Uh, I think that I've mentioned this summer that Hope has planted an entire vegetable forest in our backyard. Um, now, uh, we used to have a patio that had outdoor furniture and two grills because we live in Kansas. Um, we had plenty of room to spread out, to, to have people over, to relax. Uh, now, in place of all of that, we have vegetables and some fruits and, and some herbs. Uh, we have tomato plants that are as tall as me. We have uh, peppers and cucumbers that are beginning to take shape. We have uh, basil and lavender that, that is in bloom. Uh, we have pots that are overflowing with these beautiful beautiful flowers of every color. And we just recently, we, I mean, hope just recently found some, some small corner of space that wasn't taken up. And now we have succulents uh, in the, the back, in the, the last little bit of real estate that remained. I'm told our furniture is still out there, but, but I can't confirm that. Anyway, that's what hope does to, 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 to find that restoration for her. That is restorative. That, that helps build her soul to take tiny seeds or small little plants and to see them grow into this beautiful ve vegetable forest. She likes getting up in the morning, watering them, feeding them, uh, talking to them, you know, doing all the things that you do. 
In the mornings lately, while she's doing that, I, I've been running and I've been doing it for Team World Vision. And I do it certainly because I want to raise money to bring clean water to kids in Africa. That's a piece of it. But I also do it. And by the way, I've been reminding myself of this the last couple of weeks. Uh, once I get into the rhythm, I haven't yet. It's been a slower process. But once I get into the rhythm, uh, that, that running is restorative for me. The sun and the fresh air in the morning and the smell uh, 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 of the, the morning as I run through the neighborhood or through a park, that recenters me. Uh, that, that helps me get energy out. That helps me connect with God. I pray sometimes while I'm running. Uh, sometimes it's just to get through it. But sometimes it's, it's other sorts of prayer. But, but that for me helps me feel alive. It re, reignites the spark in me. So I want to ask again, what's that look like for you? So recently, um, actually on Monday of this week, on, on, on one of those runs, I was listening to a book by one of my favorite authors, Barbara Brown Taylor. Interestingly enough, I, I stumbled upon it and I realized that, that I had listened to most of the audiobook uh, while I ran my half marathon, my first half marathon last October, and I hadn't listened to it since then. And so I guess now that I'm training again, it, it made sense that I would finish the book and pick it back up. So the book is called Learning to Walk in the Dark, and I love it. And you may hear uh, more about it in the the time to come, but she's talking about what she learned about being in the dark, both physical dark and sort of spiritual darkness, and, and how darkness often has something to teach us, and how odd it is that God often shows up right in the midst of it. So this chapter I was listening to on Monday, it began with this interesting story. She finds, talks about finding this old uh, Buddhist magazine in her house, which included an article by a, a guy named uh, Clark Strand. He suffered from insomnia, which led him to uh, do some research and discover uh, 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 an old study that was conducted by the National Institute of Mental Health, where scientists tried to see if they could replicate the pattern of sleep that might have existed before we had easy access to artificial light. So the, the study participants were limited uh, to exposure uh, based on the natural cycle of the sun. And uh, Barbara Brown Taylor says this about it, and I'm gonna read a, a little bit. She says, at first the study participants uh, played catch up, sleeping on average, uh, an average of 11 hours a day. Eventually they settled into eight hours again, but the hours were not consecutive. With 14 full hours of darkness available to them, most lay quietly in bed for a couple of hours each night before falling soundly asleep. Four hours later, they would wake up and spend a couple of hours resting before falling asleep again. And so this caught my attention as I'm running and listening to this, actually coming out of last weekend, thinking about uh, recovery, uh, about how uh, the folks needed 11 hours on average to sort of catch up when they began this experiment. So I was thinking about that. That's what, that's what caught my mind and thinking about how many, I just wonder like, uh, how many of us need those 11 hour days to get caught up? Maybe that's what vacation looks like for you. Maybe you're in that recovery. So I was thinking about it from that perspective. But then as I listened on, it got me thinking about this week, uh, about what, what possibilities need to be restored in us, what needs to be recreated within us. If we continue to take the opportunity after we've done that, that recovery, if we continue to take that, that opportunity to rest after that, what is possible? And so I want to finish reading some of what she wrote. The rest of the hour, the, the rest hours, excuse me, turned out to be the most interesting ones to the scientists. During those hours, the sleepers were neither actively awake nor soundly asleep. Their body chemistry hummer, hovered somewhere between the two, just like their brain waves did. The director of the study said it was like finding a fossil of human consciousness, a state of awareness that, was, that had largely withered away. In prehistoric times, this rest state may have provided the channel to communication between dreams and the waking life, supplying rich resources for myth and fantasy. It also might explain why so many biblical stories are powered by big dreams. But once people, the participants, uh, once, I'm sorry, once all of us had learned how to light the night, we began to cut down on the number of hours that we spent in darkness every day. The long hours of rest before, during, and after sleep were gone, along with the state of consciousness that went with them, the collateral damage of a world that is in love with light. So friends, uh, how will you rest after recovery?
How will you be invited to, to, to move at the speed of a child to find that restoration? Perhaps uh, not altogether unlike what, what Barbara Brown Taylor talks about. We'll find a new level of consciousness in which we experience something new, which we experience a uh, filling up and possibilities that we don't experience otherwise. How is it that we find that for our soul, that sort of rest and recreation and recreation and restoration? What does that look like in our lives? How do we find that which has been uh, revealed to the infant inside of all of us? What is it that reminds you uh, of that time that we all need and allows you to experience it? How is it that we reignite the holy spark? What is it that brings life and vitality and energy to you? It, it might be uh, uh, getting away or it might be uh, where it is that, that, that you are right now, where you're watching this uh, right this moment. How do you participate in rest and restoration that recreates and restores something deep inside of you? Maybe it's not hours between sleep, though maybe it is. Uh, but, but what is it that invites you into that consciousness that supplies rich resources for your life? And as Barbara Brown Taylor says, powers big dreams. In our scripture this morning, Jesus begins by inviting his hearers to lay down what weighs them down, uh, their heavy burdens, which makes any of us weary. Uh, we might call that a, a step towards rest that brings about recovery. But he doesn't stop there. He invites them to take his yoke upon themselves to learn from him, from God's way of doing things. Taking on his ways is easy, his burden is light, and he promises that we will find rest rest for our souls. And, and maybe that rest is part of what we call restoration. Friends, every time I read this scripture, I, I can't help but think about Eugene Peterson's translation of it in the Message Bible. And so I, I just want to share his words, uh, his translation of Matthew, uh, these verses uh, 28 through 30, as we begin to wrap up. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion, come to me, get away with me and you'll recover life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn how to live freely and lightly. Friends, in this season, it is my prayer that each one of us would find rest and find those generative, restorative, recreating, unforced rhythms of grace. May you discover those in the days and the weeks ahead. May each one of us discover them. Amen. I'll invite you to take a few moments for reflection. Friends, but part of what we're invited into as people of faith, uh, followers of Christ, is to, to take a part of what we've been given, uh, to share it back with God, what we've been entrusted, to give it back to the work that God is doing, and to find that God does marvelous and incredible things with it. I'd invite you to consider giving. You can see ways to do that on the screen and to know that we are blessed to be a blessing, uh, that to give is a blessing and that those who receive, those whose lives are impacted by the ministry that happens through this community, they too are blessed. So let us give generously and with grateful hearts. And I'd invite you to join in this last song. Son of God, shaper of the stars, you alone, the dweller of my heart, mighty King, how beautiful you are, how beautiful, Son of God. The Father's gift to us, you alone were broken on the altar of love, precious Lamb, our freedom's in your blood, it's in your blood, Jesus, oh Holy One, I sing to you. Savior, I'm over.
overcome with your great love for me. Son of God, strength beyond compare, you alone the darkness cannot bear. Lord of love, your kindness draws me near. It draws me. Son of God, the prophecy of old, you alone, redeemer of my soul. Come again. And lead your people home Come and lead us home, Jesus Oh, Holy One, I sing to you Forgiven, Savior, I'm overcome with your sing to you forgiven Savior I'm overcome with your great love for me with your great love with your great love for me Friends, as we uh, continue in the days and the weeks ahead, I hope that you find opportunity for rest, not only as recovery, but rest as restoration. Uh, That which fills up your soul, which gives you energy, which reignites the spark. I hope that you're able to experience those unforced rhythms of grace that God invites us into. As we think about our life as a community, I think that's so important in this time that we find ourselves in as we look to the future, knowing that change is coming and new opportunities are on the horizon. In these moments, may we find ways as individuals and as a community to rest, to wait on God, to be filled up, to be restored and made new. May we find ways to experience those unforced rhythms of grace. Go in peace, friends. Amen.